Welcome back to our six-part series on the Second Vatican Council from a Salvation Historical Perspective. In the last two lessons, we talked about the Church and her own self-understanding, and especially the importance of her teachings, called doctrines, as well as her sacraments, those two giving us the truth and grace that we need for salvation. We also concluded that talk with the understanding that because we see these truths and the graces given to us through the sacraments as tremendous gifts from God, that out of charity for others, we want to bring those same truths and graces to others. And so this sixth and final lesson will be about the church ad extra, that is the church in relation to those outside of her. And in this lesson, then, we will talk about three different aspects of the church ad extra and how she relates to others. First, we've got ecumenism. Now, ecumenism is the dialogue and cooperation amongst Christians. So this would be, for instance, Catholics dialoguing with Eastern Orthodox or with Anglicans or with Lutherans and the like. Interreligious dialogue, on the other hand, is a dialogue that happens between Catholics or Christians and non-Christians, people of non-Christian religions. So there is a distinction between these two. And then finally, we will end with the discussion of the church's missionary activity. And one of the things I really want to point out in this lesson is that there, are, there has been some confusion where some people think that the church's teaching in Vatican II about ecumenism and interreligious dialogue somehow negates the church's missionary activity. And I'll show you through the documents themselves that that is not the case at all. And so we'll be able to see how all these things are related together. <clears throat> First of all, the document on ecumenism is called Unitatis Redintegratio, which is Latin for the restoration of unity. So right from the title itself, you can see that the document on ecumenism is not downplaying the need for Christian unity and therefore isn't just saying that, oh, you're okay, we're okay, we're all fine the way we are, we don't really need to belong to the same church. That's not what it's saying. The very title bespeaks the need to restore the unity that has been lost throughout the centuries. The very opening line of this document says, the restoration of unity among all Christians is one of the principal concerns of the Second Vatican Council. Why is the council so concerned with restoring Christian unity? It answers that in the second sentence. Christ the Lord founded one church and one church only. For some of you, that might be surprising to hear that that's how the document on ecumenism starts. But after it mentions the fact that Christ the Lord established one church and one church only, it just admits the fact that there have been divisions that have crept in. And it says that such division openly contradicts the will of Christ, scandalizes the world, and damages the holy cause of preaching the gospel to every creature. You see, the lack of Christian unity actually makes the missionary work of the church more difficult. Because if Christians are divided amongst themselves about what Christ taught and what the truth of revelation is, about what we must do and how salvation is afforded us, then it's hard for non-Christians to take us seriously. They don't know who to believe or who to listen to. And so it, our own divisions as Christians hamper our ability to convert others to Christ. And so the document says that there's actually a need for repentance from this objective situation of schism, of break amongst Christians and says that it's objectively a sinful situation. But the Council Fathers began to see some hope that there's repentance that's starting to take place from this. As it says, But the Lord of ages wisely and patiently follows out the plan of grace on our behalf, sinners that we are. In recent times, more than ever before, he has been rousing divided Christians to remorse over their divisions and to a longing for unity. Thus, the Council wishes to set before all Catholics the ways and means by which they too 
can respond to this grace. Now, the first chapter of Unitatis Rei Integratio is on the Catholic principles of ecumenism. So before it gets into the way that ecumenism should be done and practiced, it's going to give us principles to help us orient the way that we act. So the principles form the basis for how we should act. And it starts by giving us several biblical passages that emphasize the need for unity and that uni unity amongst Christians is what God's will actually is. <clears throat> So again, there's the Catholic principles of ecumenism. There's a number of important passages that the document refers to. It says, it refers to Christ's emphatic prayer in John chapter 17, when he prays to the Father that they may all be one as even thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So Christ himself is proclaiming in this passage the need for unity amongst his believers and how that unity would actually further the mission of converting others. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 5. Again, the New Testament testifying to the fact that this unity is the will of God itself. The apostles themselves warned against rifts amongst the church. But despite the express will of Christ, despite the warnings of the apostles and the early church fathers, the document admits in subsequent centuries much more serious dissensions made their appearance and quite large communities came to be separated from full communion with the Catholic Church. Notice here that this document is reaffirming what Lumen Gentium did by identifying the church established by Christ with the Catholic Church. It's referring to the communities that have broken off from her that she was the origin, the original, the church established by Christ, and that particular groups have broken off and separated from her. The document also admits that Catholics are not entirely blameless for this, that certain members of the church may have actually contributed to this insofar as their words or example or actions may have actually encouraged people to leave through their own sins and sometimes maliciousness they led other people to be tempted to leave. And so it admits that Catholics can also be part of, be part of the reason that people be tempted to leave, and therefore calls us to repentance from those things as well. The document goes on to say, though, that we need to make a distinction between those who originally separated at various stages of church history and those who are born into a situation of being divided from the Catholic Church. So it wants to make this distinction that there's a difference between the people that originally founded a separate group and those who are born into those groups in subsequent ages. And so it says, the children who are born into these communities and who grew up believing in Christ cannot be accused of the sin involved in the separation. And the Catholic Church embraces upon them as brothers with respect and affection. Now, some people get, get all bent out of shape if you say anything positive about non-Catholic Christians or non-Christians and think that it's tantamount to affirming them in their errors, but that's, that's simply not true. Um, now, there's also something else that's wrong, though, which is sometimes you might have Catholics that discourage people from converting and say, well, you know, since Vatican II, you don't really need to do that anymore. You know, it, you're fine where you are, just stay planted. And that also is false and not what the council teaches and is not something that Catholics should be doing. We, should, we shouldn't be dissuading people from converting to the church. Now, there's a, a certain line in this document that has gotten some bad press among some quarters within the church, and it's this notion of imperfect communion. <clears throat> 
Now, an attempt to try to teach against this notion of imperfect communion, some people have used an analogy with pregnancy and said, well, this is absurd. Communion is like pregnancy. You either are or you aren't. That might be a nice rhetorical force, but it isn't true. It's a bad analogy. It doesn't work because it's just simply not true that it's either all or nothing when it comes to communion. And we know that from our last lesson. If you recall, we mentioned that the that full incorporation into the church, full communion with the church, has at least three components to it. The common faith, the celebration or reception of the sacraments, and communion in the hierarchical governance of the church. And we noted that it would be possible to lack one or more of those three elements of communion. And so it's simply not the case that it's either communion or not communion at all. And so the council was trying to show that there are various degrees and kinds of communion that can take place. And it's just simply the case when you think about it logically as well. First of all, baptism. It has been the perennial teaching of the Catholic Church that baptism is valid even if it takes place outside of the Catholic Church. Yet baptism unites one to Christ, and baptism incorporates you in the church in some way, you can't be united to Christ and not somehow also connected to his bride and his body, the church. And so baptism itself does bind you somehow to the church, at least to some extent. It might not be full and complete, which is why confirmation and the Holy Eucharist are also sacraments of initiation that perfect that union. But that union is still there nonetheless. So the document says, for men who believe in Christ and have been truly baptized are in communion with the Catholic Church, even though this communion is imperfect. So, again, there is these different levels of possible communion, which is why Lumen Gentium talked about what it meant to be in full communion, full incorporation. There's also other things that we share with our fellow Christians. Love for Scripture, for example. That's something that binds us. We all love sacred Scripture. And so that's something that brings us together and unites us. The Eastern Orthodox even have valid holy orders and valid Eucharist. And so that's something that we have in common as well. And we can't just pretend like somehow they're no different than non-Christians with respect to its, their relationship to the Catholic Church. So it would be foolish to say that there's absolutely no level of communion at all if you're not just, a, it's either full communion or none. So another thing that this document goes on to say is that non-Catholic Christians and non-Catholic Christian communities can actually be used by God as means of grace. It says that they should not be seen as being totally deprived of significance in the mystery of salvation. But then also adds the caveat, though we believe them to be deficient in some respects. So again, even in this document on, on ecumenism, the council is not foregoing its teaching that it understands the Catholic Church to be the church established by Christ and the only place in which that one church of Christ subsists in her fullness. But it is saying they still have elements of grace and truth that they can be used as means of salvation by God, even if there are some deficiencies in them. But this means there's no false ecumenism here. As a matter of fact, it goes on to say that these elements found outside of the church derive their efficacy from the very fullness of grace and truth entrusted to the church. Now, another thing that this document does is lament over non-Catholic Christians lack of certain aspects of being fully incorporated into the Catholic Church. It states, Nevertheless, our separated brethren, whether considered as individuals or as communities and churches, are not blessed with that unity which Jesus Christ wished to bestow on all those who through him are born again into one body. That unity which the Holy Scriptures and the ancient tradition of the church proclaim. For it is only through Christ's Catholic Church, which is the all-embracing means of salvation, that they can benefit fully from the means of salvation. 
We believe that our Lord entrusted all the blessings of the new covenant to the apostolic college alone, of which Peter is the head, in order to establish the one body of Christ on earth to which all should be fully incorporated who belong in any way to the people of God. So does this sound untraditional or heterodox? I don't think so. Is this proclaiming some form of religious indifferentism as some people charge the council with? Absolutely not. Now, the ecumenical movement of which the council speaks is precisely geared towards reunion of Christians. But one of the principles that it highlights for us as Catholics is first, of every effort to avoid expressions, judgments, and actions which do not represent the condition of our separated brethren with truth and fairness, and so make mutual relations with them more difficult. So what is it saying there? It's saying that we have to be careful when we're dealing with our separated brethren, our non-Catholic Christians, that we can't just say nasty things about them or their situation, especially if they're untrue. We have to be charitable and we also have to be accurate in what we say. We already know that we can often be accused of all sorts of things that are simply not true about Catholicism in our faith and what we believe. And so we have to be very careful not to be misleading about what others hold as well. We need to hold ourselves to this higher standard. Now, another principle that the council expresses is the need for competent experts from the different churches and communities to come together. And part of the reason for that is the mutual understanding that happens through this dialogue with, between churches and ecclesial communities. It says, each explains the teaching of his communion in greater depth and brings out clearly its distinctive features. In such dialogue, everyone gains a truer knowledge and more just appreciation of the teachings and religious life of both communions. There's also other forms of cooperation, which is things that are for the common good, like the pro-life movement. But this dialogue that takes place between theological experts from different churches and ecclesial communities helps avoid what I was talking about earlier, this misunderstanding where we might think that okay, the, the Lutherans believe this, or the Baptists believe that, or the Orthodox hold this position. This dialogue enables us to find out from their own mouths what they actually do hold, so that we can then understand better where they're coming from. And it also gives us an opportunity to present our Catholic beliefs to them. It exposes them to what we believe. And that's a great benefit indeed, and that's why the Council encouraged this ecumenical dialogue. It helps get rid of a lot of misconceptions. There's already enough obstacles to unity as there is. One thing we don't need is to be fighting over th things that simply aren't even true, thinking that they hold one thing when they, they don't. And so this dialogue helps clarify exactly where the agreements are and where the disagreements are. This tremendously helps us relate to one another and have a better appreciation. And we obviously know that, you know, all this is relational. Someone is being, going to be more willing to listen to you if you're willing to listen to them. And so that mutual respect in, in the dialogue creates a much better environment for all of us. It also says that there can be some prayer together. It says wherever this is allowed, there is prayer in common. Now, of course, there are limits. You know, we can't hold the mass together, for instance. But it does encourage us under proper circumstances to pray together with non-Catholic Christians. Okay, just as one example, I'd like to point to the Joint International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Churches. I've actually had some professors that were a part of that and got to study some of the documents that came out of those the meetings that they had. Now, there were some hiccups in the history of that Catholic Orthodox dialogue, but they've also produced some beautiful documents that help me understand my own Catholic faith better through the dialogue with the Orthodox. And so there can be tremendous benefit when we gather together and tackle these theological questions. And it really has shown me how much we have in common with them and also clarified 
exactly where there are still differences that need to be overcome. And so there's been a lot of fruit out of ecumenical dialogue since the council itself. Now again, at the end of chapter one, it once again affirms the purpose of ecumenical dialogue. It works towards a time when, quote, all Christians will at last, in a common celebration of the Eucharist, be gathered into the one and only church in that unity which Christ bestowed on his church from the beginning. And lest anyone think that this implies some form of indifferentism, the document immediately states, we believe that this unity subsists in the Catholic Church as something she can never lose, and we hope that it will continue to increase until the end of time. So dialogue doesn't mean eschewing our Catholic beliefs from the beginning. I had a professor once who said, you know, dialogue is not dialogue if you give up your position before you even start. Dialogue involves an honest presentation of your beliefs and an honest listening to the beliefs of the other side. It goes on to say, it is of course essential that the doctrine should be clearly presented in its entirety. Nothing is so foreign to the spirit of ecumenism as a false arenicism in which the purity of Catholic doctrine suffers loss and its genuine meaning is clouded. So here again, the council is basically saying, when you engage in ecumenical dialogue, you can't give up aspects of your faith. You can't water it down. You can't pretend it says one thing when it says the opposite. You need to be open and honest and present the fullness of the Catholic teaching in that dialogue. And it also goes against false arenicism, meaning this pretending that everything is fine and peaceful the way that it is, which would then lull us into this notion that we don't need to work towards a reunion, which would be a if we did that, we wouldn't be fulfilling the purpose of ecumenical dialogue, which is to reestablish union. Okay. Now, the document does go on to talk about different types of schisms that have happened within Christian history, and it gives its evaluation of what that means about the church's relationship to different types of Christian churches and ecclesial communities. So, <clears throat> There are essentially two different types of schisms that have taken place. You have the schism that originally happened between the East and the West. And so after the Council of Ephesus and Chalcedon in 431 and 451, you had certain bishops and their communities that didn't accept the, those council's teachings. And those ended up separating then from communion with the rest of the church, with the Catholic Church. And those continue to exist in some form in the Oriental Orthodox churches. And then, of course, around 1054, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the general date given for the Great Schism. You had the separation between the church, the Catholic Church, and the Eastern Orthodox churches. And sadly, even today, fairly recently, the Eastern Orthodox Church itself has suffered a schism between Constantinople and Moscow. And so these sorts of divisions have taken place. So that's one kind. The other kind of division took place through the Protestant Reformation beginning in the 16th century, the early 1500s. And so this document makes a distinction between the schisms that happened between the East and the West and then within the West itself in the Catholic Protestant divide. So the major difference there is that the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox maintained apostolic succession. And if you recall from our discussions on the church, apostolic succession is how the bishops received the authority from the apostles and how that's been handed on throughout the generations. It's also the means by which holy orders has been maintained as a valid sacrament. So they have apostolic succession, which means they have validly ordained bishops and validly ordained priests, which means they can have a valid celebration of the Holy Eucharist. And as we also noted in our discussion on the church, the church is the church through the Eucharist. The Eucharist makes the church in some sense. It's our reception of the body of Christ that makes us the body of Christ. And so because we see this intrinsic link between the Eucharist and the church, we see a qualitative difference between a community that has valid Eucharist and one that does not, which is why in the documents of Vatican II, you'll see two different terms used. 
you have churches, and then you have ecclesial communities. So these are two different forms of identity, you will, that, that the council gives to different non-Catholic Christian groups. The churches are those that have valid Eucharist. Now, again, this isn't denying that the Warren Church of Christ subsists only in the Catholic Church, but because of that intimate union between the Eucharist and the church, it will refer to those as churches in some sense. If the com community does not have a valid Eucharist, then theologically speaking, we can't call them churches, so we refer to them as ecclesial communities, meaning communities having some sort of church-like qualities and characteristics. And that's the reason for the difference in terminology. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean that you as a Catholic go around to all of your Protestant brothers and sisters and tell them that they aren't churches. This is technical terminology used in theology to make a distinction between those two types of schism and breaks with the church to show that the Eastern Orthodox, in some sense, for instance, are closer in relation to us than those that resulted from the Protestant Reformation. So it's expressing the fact that there are these different levels of either closeness or distance from the Catholic Church. So that's, it's just a helpful way of understanding that those differences there. Now, when it comes to interreligious dialogue, which again is different from ecumenical dialogue, interreligious dialogue is with non-Christians. There's not as much in Vatican II about this, but it does have something to say in Nostra Aetate, where it says, the church therefore exhorts her sons that through dialogue and cooperation with the followers of other religions carried out with prudence and love and in witness to the Christian faith and life, they recognize, preserve, and promote good things, spiritual and moral, as well as the socio-cultural values found among these men. Notice here that in this statement about having dialogue and collaboration with non-Christians, it still inserts in witness to the Christian faith. Which means, again, the council itself saw no division between ecumenical dialogue and interreligious dialogue on the one hand and missionary evangelization on the other. They are completely compatible. Now, the council also calls for mutual respect between Christians and other non-Christians, including those of the Jewish faith, those of Islam, what have you. It calls for us to, it denounces anti-Semitism, it also decries any discrimination or, or harassment against non-Christians in general. And it calls us to follow the examples of Saints Peter and Paul when it quotes the words of 1 Peter 2.12. Maintain good fellowship among the nations, and if possible, to live for their part in peace with all men. So it wants us to collaborate with non-Christians and work towards a mutual better relationship to work together for peace, to put an end to war, and to help understand each other better and to listen to one another and to find out what we actually believe. Okay, so all of this now leads up to our consideration of the church's missionary activity, which we've already seen brought up in Lumen Gentium and elsewhere, but the main decree was ad gentes, and it develops organically out of the other documents. Ad Gentes often cites the other documents, especially Lumen Gentium, when it discusses the church's missionary activity. Okay, so just to reiterate, despite misrepresentations that the council somehow downplayed the need for mission due to the possibility of a non-Catholic being saved, the documents of the council say quite the opposite. Quote, Although in ways known to himself, God can lead those who through no fault of their own are ignorant of the gospel to faith without which it is impossible to please him. The church nevertheless still has the obligation and also the sacred right to evangelize. It also states that the missionary activity of the church helps purify what is true and good in 
the other religions and philosophies. Because we saw before that the church says that it rejects nothing of what is true and good in those religions. Yet missionary activity, it says, can actually help purify them. How does it do this? It says that missionary activity purges of evil associations those elements of truth and grace which are found among peoples. And it restores them to Christ, their source, who overthrows the rule of the devil and limits the manifold malice of evil. So the missionary activity itself does not work against the truth and goodness of other religions and among the nations. It actually helps reincorporate them into the integrity of the fullness of the truth and goodness. And thus it says, whatever goodness is found in people's minds and hearts or in the particular customs and cultures of peoples, far from being lost, is purified, raised to a higher level, and reaches its perfection for the glory of God, the confusion of the demon, and the happiness of humankind. Thus, missionary activity tends toward eschatological fullness. Missionary activity actually brings the goodness and truth found throughout the world, reincorporates it into the fullness of truth, and thus brings people to salvation. And so I hope we can see that throughout this entire course, there has been this trajectory of God creating us to be in communion with himself and with one another. Sadly, we have the reality of sin that has separated us from God, has divided humanity, thus separating us from one another, and also hurt us interiorly within our own individual selves. And as we said, we need to be redeemed from that. In order to do this, we have to seek the truth and adhere to it. And thus, the church teaches we have the co-relative right to religious freedom so that we can pursue this truth. People of various times and places, and even through the various non-Christian religions, have tried to answer questions such as what is the meaning of life and what is the goal of humanity. And sometimes they get parts of that right. They reflect the truth and exhibit goodness that can be understood as preparations for receiving the gospel. Yet their teachings still do contain error and sometimes very grave error and therefore a need of correction and purification. Thus, to make the truth about himself and his saving will known to humanity, God has revealed himself to us in history through his deeds and words, and most especially through Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, who through the assumption of a complete human nature and by the merits of his paschal mystery has enabled us to be redeemed and healed to ensure that his saving truth and the graces of his passion, death, and resurrection would spread throughout the world until the end of time, Christ established the church on the foundation of the apostles. Through scripture and tradition, the church hands on the truth of divine revelation and authoritatively interprets it through her magisterium, her teaching office, based on the authority given to the bishops as the successors to the apostles. The sacraments, likewise, are means of grace given to the church by which she sanctifies us. Following the command of Christ, the sanctifying grace and the communion with God and one another that the church signifies and effects is shared with others in charity for the salvation of the whole world. While God offers salvation to all, even to those who are inculpably ignorant of the gospel in ways known to himself alone, the church still has the obligation and the right to evangelize through her missionary activity. Religious relativism, religious indifferentism, and false irenicism have no place in Catholic teaching, since they are contrary to the truth revealed to us by God. Lest we, lest we be too puffed up and arrogant, however, we are reminded by the church that unless we ourselves persevere in charity, we Catholics will not only not be saved, but will be all the more severely condemned. Thus, there is no reason to boast, and boldly proclaiming the truth about salvation in Christ and His Church is not an act of pride, but a humble admission that the truth comes from God. And we are merely obliged, and gladly so, to bring His truth, His love, and His grace to the whole world. 
the goal is salvation, which as a reflection of the inner Trinitarian communion of love is also communal. For we believe in the communion of saints who united with God are also intimately united with one another. We are called to this holy communion and are called to help others enter into it as well. Hopefully this course has enlightened you to see how these different teachings all coalesce into this one grand mystery of salvation and of faith, where we know that we were created and loved by God and called back to loving communion with Him, and thus also communion with one another in the one body of Christ. God bless. Thank you.